Hello, my friends across the fruited and rooted plain. Thanks for tuning in the Gardening Simplified show and Happy New Year as we broadcast from the beautiful studios of Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs. She is Stacy Hervella. I am Rick Weist and Adriana Robinson, our engineer producer, joins us here for a New Year show. Stacy, uh, you know, I love statistics and reading surveys and that sort of thing. And I was going to share with everyone that I read this past week that if you go to a New Year's Eve party this year, make sure you leave within an hour after the ball drops. Most people feel that's the appropriate time to leave a New Year's Eve party. I mean, I'm not a good source on this because I... Uh, don't usually make it that late uh, and probably would be gone before the ball drops. Uh-huh. Uh, that, But that's just me. I, well, you know. I just mention it okay. as a public service All right, good, good to know. I think most people who are hosting parties probably don't want everyone to stay till all hours. But, exactly. uh, you know, well, it, it, it depends on the party. So thanks for tuning us in and, of course, uh, downloading, listening to the podcast as we enter 2023. Boy, we'd love to have you share the podcast, listen, and uh, share it with friends and neighbors. Of course, also on YouTube, look for Gardening Simplified Show, subscribe. And then, of course, thanks to all of you who listen to us on the airwaves on Radio Wood Radio, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Stacy. Uh, 2022 put a fork in it. It's done. We look back, we think about it. Yes. And we think about it, uh, as gardeners and what kind of gardening year was 2022 for you? Uh, it was an interesting one. I mean, every year is an interesting year in the garden, right? There's always something that you learn, no matter what the weather does, how cooperative, uncooperative it is, you learn. Mm -hmm. And I would say my number one lesson of 2022, and it was not based on the weather, it was completely my own fault, is that yes, you can grow too many hot peppers. Yes, you can. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, this is, I, 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 you, I would say it's a rookie mistake, but obviously it, I'm not a rookie. I've been gardening for many, many years. But you know, when it's, sp when it's late winter, early spring, and you're planning what you're buying seeds for and what you're going to grow, you're so sick of winter and you're just like, yeah, I'm going to mm -hmm. hit it in the garden this year. I am going to tear it up. And I was just like, I want all the hot peppers. So I ordered... A bunch of hot pepper seed, got it started, you know, and I gave some away, uh, but I had probably something around 25 plants. Now, I don't have a big vegetable garden because I have to fence it off from the deer. Wow. Um, and I probably so it, and the deer do eat hot peppers, so it's not really their first choice, but I, there's nothing worse than the feeling of, you know, going out to the garden in August and the deer suddenly decided to eat the hot peppers. So I only grow them in my uh, exclosure there. And uh, I can tell you it was way, way too many hot pepper plants because there's really only so much you can do with hot peppers. Well, but you can't get blamed for that because you're right. In spring, we get excited. We're looking forward to spring 2023 and sharing it with you. And, you know, you have a tendency, for example, to put too many tomato plants in the ground. That's another one that you do. It's, it's kind of like the, uh, the buffet at a Las Vegas casino. You know, your eyes are bigger than your stomach and there you go. But uh, hey, it's fun. Uh, this past year, what I learned, uh, one thing, of course, I'm, I'm someone who loves to track GDD, which is growing degree day accumulation, especially in spring. And boy, this past spring, uh, March and April, were very, very cold in the Midwest, in the north, in Michigan, where we are. Uh, March and April snow. So things got off to a very, very slow start. As a matter of fact, I was checking uh, we had accumulated 85 days by May 4th. The previous year, we were at 201 days using 50 degrees as a base. So a really wow. slow start. But it was a great gardening season. And it was a great year for fruit and gardening. And so, Stacy, it leads me to believe that even though I'm anxious and ready to go in spring, and, and you know how I feel about winter, um, the plants like to wake up kind of slowly and gradually. Yeah, you know, there's so many factors, and we got lucky that it was a good year for fruit because we didn't get any of those, you know, super warm-ups that start to push the apple blossoms and so forth really fast and then followed by, uh, you know, a sudden cold snap frost, that freezes yeah. them off. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, it was a very good year for fruit trees. And, you know, I um, 
every year at, that you garden, you know, you become more and more attuned to the weather and how the weather impacts plants and everything around you. And, uh, you know, there is no perfect season. No, <laughs> so, no. But there's always an opportunity to learn. That's why we're here. That's why we're here. The Gardening Simplified Show. Drought was a big story worldwide. Uh, drought was definitely an issue. And then as it is, uh, boy, lately, as it has always been, uh, Stacy, I was looking at the National Invasive Species Information Center. The number of invasive species, whether they're insects or plants that we're dealing with, uh, it's significant. Yeah, and it just keeps growing as yeah. things become, you know, closer and closer together. We're able to ship things faster. Uh, there's all sorts of, uh, of nasties that can happen out there. Uh, also, uh, it was interesting, at least for me, and I think that this is a reality in 20. 20, a lot of people started journaling. Mm. And of course, we stayed at home. Well, even now, there are a number of Americans who find themselves spending more time at home. And in spending more time at home, you develop a closer, better relationship with your plants, maybe do a little more gardening, a little more care of the yard. As a matter of fact, at home, these folks who said they were spending more time at home they prioritized and spent more time first in the yard, second followed by the kitchen, and third, the living room. Sounds about right. I think so. Yeah. It does. It does for me. And then, of course, in 2022, uh, flowering shrub of the year was double play doozy spirea, and the hydrangea of the year was little quick fire. Yes. Two great plants. Two great plants. And, you know, we have not talked too much about double play doozy spirea yet. Uh, but it is honestly one of the most impressive plants that I have ever seen. Uh, we'll definitely be putting it on trial maybe this, you know, May or June when it's in bloom. But it has quickly rocketed to become one of our best sellers because it is the first and only uh, re-blooming, perpetually blooming spirea. It's it really beautiful. doesn't stop. It's, it's an extraordinary, extraordinary plant and pretty much as close as you can come to something that doesn't stop flowering. And I know that's what people want. The holy grail of flowering shrubs is something that doesn't stop flowering. And I would say double play usually comes pretty darn close. Well, and that's the point. I'm amazed. Uh, I continue to be amazed by the development of plants that perform better and better within our landscape. And, you know, I know I'm getting to be an old guy. And uh, I remember the garden industry 40 years ago. And, for example, what petunias were like and what they're like today uh, like with the Supertunia Vista uh, series, or roses for that matter. Landscape roses are sensational. It's unreal how many proven winners, color choice, uh, rose choices there are, and how they perform in the landscape compared to what we were putting in our yards 40 years ago. Yeah, the entire rose industry has really just been turned on its ear. And uh, it's just fascinating to see what's coming out. And, you know, I'm lucky because working at Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, I get to see sort of what's next, what we're evaluating. And I'll tell you, our rose trial is really a sight to behold. I mean, we have hundreds and hundreds of roses around the world, most of which will never see the light of day. Uh, because they're not going to meet our standards for disease resistance and reblooming and all of that. But uh, it's really, really fun to see the diversity out there and to see all of the creativity in plant breeding. So even though it's difficult to stay up until one in the morning on New Year's Eve, when it comes to roses, you really rose to the occasion, let me tell you. <laughs> so we've got a great gardening season ahead. We're looking forward to sharing it with you here on the Gardening Simplified show. I want to remind you to visit GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. And uh, Stacy, I'm really looking forward to it. As a matter of fact, as we get into January, we will talk about gardening trends. And in addition to that, the, uh, the National Plants of the Year. And there are some fabulous National Plants of the Year coming up to talk about. Absolutely. So looking forward to it. Coming up next, we're going to put a plant on trial. Stacy's going to introduce us to a new plant. We'll put it on trial. That's coming up next here on the Gardening Simplified Show. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified Show, where we simplify gardening for you. Now, uh, at this point in the show, we put a plant on trial, which is to say we give you a chance to decide if you're going to add this plant to your garden or not. But before I do that, I have to offer a public apology. 
What's that? A public apology. Uh, I put this in the show notes, uh, which you can find at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. But a few shows ago, we were talking about the Christmas bird count. Yeah. And uh, Christmas is, has come and gone, of course, but the Christmas bird count is, uh, is still on or winding up right now. And when I was talking about the Christmas bird count, I said, oh, you just have to, you know, look out your window and count the birds that come to your backyard. But no, that's not the Christmas bird count. That's the backyard bird count. Uh, I got the Christmas huh. bird count and the backyard bird count, both of which are Audubon Society sanctioned events, confused. So if you missed the Christmas bird count is an organized event where you join a Christmas bird count in your area, join with other birders and, and count birds that you that you see. The backyard bird count, which is coming up uh, in January, so you still have time to plan and participate, uh, is one where that's where you just report what comes to your specific yard. So Good to know. my apologies for the confusion on that. If you uh, thought you were Christmas bird counting and sitting in your yard, you weren't. But it's not too late to do that for the backyard bird count. So you'll find all of those details at the show notes. And there is my public apology to birders everywhere. A bird in the hand is as good as a apology. <laughs> I just made that up. <laughs> all right. So today's plant on trial Glitters and Glows Viburnum. I like that. You're glittering right I now. Know. You look we, fabulous for our New Year's Eve show. We are glittering and glowing yes. uh, specifically for our show. So you can catch us on YouTube if you want to see our fancy duds for New Year's Eve. Uh, and the reason I picked this is because, of course, New Year's Eve is a night to sparkle. Yeah, you bet. Uh, whether you're in your pajamas or your fanciest <laughs> duds, it is still a night to sparkle and celebrate. Um, and, well, Glitters and Glows Viburnum doesn't quite sparkle like the sequins on the sweater I'm wearing today. Uh, it is a fantastic plant that deserves to be better known, and it is very shiny. Mm. Uh, it is a Viburnum dentatum var or var, uh, variety demii. Now, that is a mouthful for the radio. I'm glad you said it. <laughs> uh, in other words, it is a southern form of our native arrowwood viburnum. Now, you know arrowwood viburnum, sure. right? Very mm -hmm. popular landscape plant. This southern version, which is where the var variety demii comes in, is known for extremely glossy foliage. And you really have to see it to believe it. The foliage, it looks like it's wet or covered in wax all the time and wow. um, really just beautiful. Now, this is a deciduous plant, so you, you would not be seeing glitters and glows, viburnum, glittering and glowing in your landscape at this particular moment. Uh, but I still thought between the name and the plant itself that it was an appropriate one to feature on our New Year's Eve show. You know, I love viburnum foliage as it is, you know, uh, the fall color yep. and the texture to it. And then to add this glitter and glow, and then Stacy with glitter, glitters and glows viburnum. If you're keeping score at home, I would suspect that this is a viburnum also that offers some color in the form of fruit. Absolutely. So uh, it has blue fruit. So arrowwood viburnum is known for sort of a, a dark powder, well, not powdery blue, but like a deep blue fruit. Very, very attractive. It's not edible. Uh, so if I accidentally, while I'm talking about it, say blueberries, I do not mean blueberries. It's not edible. The berries are simply blue. Uh, and it's very attractive. And it gets really nice white flowers. So, of course, it has to have flowers before it'll have fruit. And so, uh, in addition, another thing that you'll notice about this southern variant of arrowwood viburnum is that the flower clusters are much bigger and more robust. So with the regular arrowwood viburnum, they're kind of more open and sparse. And with the southern variation, they're a, a really dense uh, cluster of creamy white flowers. And then that, of course, turns into a dense cluster of nice blue fruit later on in the season. Love it. Beautiful. Now, now, I'll bet the birds do like the berries, though, right? They do. Yeah. Okay. Now, uh, here we are. It's the last day of December. Whether or not there would still be berries on your arrowwood viburnum depends on atmospheric conditions and the taste of your local birds. Uh, this is one that would typically be gone earlier in the season. I know we recently talked about winterberry holly and how that usually sticks around until, you know, mm -hmm. end of January or February. Viburnum berries are usually gone from uh, from the birds eating them much more quickly. Uh, but uh, glitters and glows viburnum, so you get the fruit. Now, what has conventionally been an issue with viburnum is their pollination. Right. right now, people have a sense, a vague sense, uh, or hopefully a good sense, that when it comes to holly, you need a male and a female plant, two different plants for the pollination, for the berries to occur only on the female plant. Well, with viburnums, you do, you do still need two plants, but the difference is that the plants aren't male and female. 
Each viburnum has male and female parts in every single flower on the plant. But what viburnums need to actually set fruit is an exchange of genetic material. They need a cross-pollination. And because they need this actual exchange, you can't just say, okay, well, I have two, you know, Chicago Lester viburnums. They won't pollinate each other because they're clones of each other. So there's no genetic exchange taking place. Does that make sense? You're, you're smiling. like uh, I'm still trying to keep up with exchange of genetic <laughs> what? Okay. It's all going to be in the show notes. So if I'm going a little too fast for you, my apologies. I just want to make sure. I get, I get this, the drift. You get all this important yeah, information in. But here's the important thing to know about glitters and glows viburnum. It takes away all that guesswork about which viburnum you need in order to get fruit because it's two different plants in one container. That's great. Yeah. All in one. All in one. So rather than, you know, uh, look at the tag and say, oh, geez, well, now I got to go find this other variety and I hope they have it. And where is it? And oh, it doesn't look as good as this one. And, you know, all of those problems, you just buy one container of Glitters and Glows Viburnum. It has two individual Viburnum plants in it. They are different plants or different varieties. So one is all that glitters Viburnum. One is all that glows Viburnum. And you just plant this one plant one time. And you get the fruit on both plants. So another great thing it has over holly, where you're only getting the fruit on the female, both plants of uh, this viburnum will oh. get will get fruit. So all that glitters is not gold, but this plant is close to it. Has many, many benefits. Now viburnums, some viburnums can get rather large. What about glitters and glows? So yeah, an arrowwood viburnum is definitely a great example. I know my mom had some on the side of her house that got kind of big and rangy and outgrew their size. Uh, whereas this one's going to be about four to six feet tall and wide. So a nice, really useful uh, shrub size for home landscaping. And it also has a much denser habit. So another thing about arrowwood viburnum, they can get kind of rangy and again, very open and sparse. Uh, this one stays quite dense and that, that glossy foliage really, really uh, makes it look fantastic uh, spring to fall. And I love one of the things I love about viburnums also is that they're they're rather versatile in the in the landscape. In other words, sun or shade or part sun, they can stand up to it, right? A hundred percent. And you know, the, I think that a lot of people, if they have shade, they're like, "Oh, viburnum is my go-to shrub because they know they have limited options." And so, viburnum is a good choice for shade. Some sun will definitely be helpful because most shrubs, even if they're shade tolerant will flower and of course subsequently fruit better if they get at least some sun each day. Now that doesn't mean, you know, hours and hours of direct sun. It can be filtered light, um, but you know, really, really deep shade. Yes, it will grow, but you're just going to have to kind of mitigate your expectations as to what the plant will look like. If you see our pictures on our show notes or on the Proof and Winners Color Choice.com website, uh, and you're like, oh yeah, that's what I want in my full shade location. It's not going to quite look like that, you know, but Heart shade, if you can swing it, will definitely help. Well, and the other great thing, Stacy, of course, people listen to the podcast, watch us on YouTube uh, from all over the country and beyond parts north. Uh, the point here is that I have found with viburnums, if you're in a cold climate, this plant does very well. As a matter of fact, in my opinion, it seems to thrive in cold climate. Yeah. And that's a good point because I did say it's a Southern variant. Right. That does not mean it's not hardy. It's actually perfectly hardy, hardy to USDA zone four. So much colder than we even have here in West Michigan and heat tolerant through zone eight. So a really nice wide range of where it can grow. Now, uh, we got so carried away talking about all the great features that I didn't have time to talk about how to grow it, but not to worry because you will find all of that on the show notes. And you've got plenty of time to research this plant because it's we're, we're a good couple months away from planting season just yet. So take the time to go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com, click on the show notes. You can see the pictures, get all the details there and add it to your spring planting list. So, when we come back, we're going to be answering your gardening questions, and you won't want to miss that, so please stay tuned. Greetings, gardening friends, and welcome back to the Gardening Simplified show, where we simplify gardening for you, and one of the ways we do that is by answering your garden questions, because uh, it's no fun being stuck with a gardening quandary and not getting, not knowing where to turn for help. And, you know, there's lots of good information on the internet, but you don't really know who's behind it. Yeah. And, you know, Santa carries this big bag of toys and gifts and we carry this big 
digital mailbag, and we want to add to it. So send us more questions at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. By the way, do you know how much Santa's sleigh costs? Oh, my goodness. I... If you had to guess, how much does that thing cost? Uh, I don't know. I'm I'm gonna have to give up. I feel like it, if I had more time, I could figure it out. It's on the house. <laughs> okay, let's go to the mailbag. Mary's wondering if big leaf hydrangeas can be. Adriana liked that one. Uh, Mary is wondering if big leaf hydrangeas, macrophyllas, yep. right? Yep. Can be planted in clay soil. I can see the look on your face. I can't believe Rick just said that. <laughs> no, I, I, I was, I like, I'm, I'm wondering. I was frantically trying to think of if a number rhymed with Santa or sleigh, and you know, you, that just totally came out of left field. So, the uh, yes. love it. So, Mary, big leaf hydrangeas. She wants to know if they can be planted in clay soil. And the answer is yes, they can. I agree. Uh, so absolutely, they love moisture, but they don't love wetness. So. That makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. I hope to most people. It does make so, sense. So, you know, they want this the soil to not dry out and be very droughty, but they absolutely cannot take very, very wet conditions. Now, as I've explained uh, in other times when I've been asking, answering questions about soil and drainage, um, a soil is uh, ideally, under ideal conditions, 50% soil particles and 50% spaces for air. When you water or it rains, uh, the air space is filled with water and if in a well-drained soil, that water drains through right. and fills them back up with air pretty quickly. And roots need oxygen. You know, yes, they're underground, but they actually need oxygen to respire and, and thrive. Uh, and in a poorly drained soil, what happens is those air spaces, the water stays in them for a really long time. And that essentially suffocates the roots. But just because you have clay soil doesn't mean it's not well-drained. No, I agree. As a matter of fact, many plants can grow in clay soil. You do have to take a little more care, a little more attention, including big leaf hydrangeas. I lived in a home once, Stacy, where uh, the clay soil was just so dense. It was a blue clay. You'd work out there like in early spring and it would suck the boots right off Oof. your feet. You would lose garden gloves or a landscape timber that would be sucked into the earth only to reappear nine months or 12 months later. Unbelievable. But I was successful growing plants, and I think the two ways that I did it was, number one, elevating the beds a little bit, and number two, working in liberal amounts of organic material because you are so right. It's those pore spaces that are so important. You know, I love when you're just like, oh, I worked in liberal amounts of organic material. That is the classic example of easier said than done. Because, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, just to mend that clay soil. And doing anything in a heavy clay soil right. is, is it, it's work. I mean, it's labor. <laughs> but it's my job to sell it, you yes. know. It's, yeah. You can do it, but it is a lot of work. Now, uh, that said, one of the things I always caution people with, uh, and this is going to be true of the big leaf hydrangeas in clay soil, too, if you do what Rick did and you thoroughly amend the bed, that is to say you're adding compost and digging it in all over, right. that's a good thing. Right. If, however, you can't, you can't take a shortcut and dig the hole for the hydrangea and then dump Agreed. compost in that hole and say, okay, yep, I took the easy way out and this You've is going to work. you created a bathtub. You have literally you created a bathtub. You made it way worse. I agree. So as long as you don't create a bathtub and just dump that in there, you're better off just planting that hydrangea into the clay soil. I know it's going to be hard to dig. Uh, but if you just put it in the clay soil and as long as it doesn't stay super, super wet or soggy, sucking your boots off like Rick's old soil, um, it will be fine. And you know, one thing that I recommend often for people who have, uh, really clay soil or, or difficult to dig in soil is to start with smaller plants, mm -hmm. you know, and that way you don't have to dig a huge hole, like for a big five gallon plant. Um, yes, it will eventually get there. You're going to have to have a little bit more patience, but, um, sometimes it can be worth it if you have a really heavy, sticky, difficult to deal with clay soil. Sounds good. All right. Debbie has a peace lily that's not doing very well. Peace lily or spathophyllum. Uh, she says there's some green stems still left from the main plant, and she waters it every week. It's in a sunny window that gets southern light. The pot doesn't have a drain hole, but there's a layer of rocks on the bottom of the pot. Can you help? Well, Debbie, one thing I would say right off the bat is Stacy is so right when she talks about digging the hole and throwing some organic material in it. You've created a bathtub 
Uh, we like to call it putting a $5 plant in a 50 cent hole. And the same applies to your house plants indoors. We have to have drainage. That gravel in the bottom, if it's retaining water, uh, is going to become a problem. That's stagnant water. And so if at all possible, uh, my recommendation is to transfer into a pot that has a drainage hole using a good lightweight sterilized houseplant soil. And uh, again, Stacy, from my experience, what I have found with a lot of folks is they struggle with the watering, like Debbie says, once a week. Don't water your plants based on a schedule. You're supposed to water your plants when they need it. Now, what a lot of people will do is, uh, and for our YouTube viewers, I'm demonstrating with my coffee mug here, but uh, they're not quite sure what to do. So they frequently give the plant just a little water. Yeah. And what happens is the roots in the upper profile of the pot remain wet and soggy. The roots in the lower portion are dust dry, and you will see it on the foliage. The foliage will turn brown. Yeah, and you know, peace lilies are an extremely uh, durable, yes. tolerant plant. And you know what they will take? Uh, they'll take drought all day long. Yes. A peace lily can wilt till it looks like it's about to die, and you just soak it in water for you know an hour or so, and it magically revives. But they I've seen them draped over the side of oh, a pot. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it can go. It's very dramatic. Uh, but they absolutely cannot take wet conditions. And, you know, I I really feel for Debbie because, uh, you know, a lot of people, they go to the garden center, they want to find a nice container for a house yes. plant or something they have, and they find something that doesn't have a drainage hole, and they think, oh, I can just put rocks in the bottom and it will take care of it. But no, that will actually make it worse because what happens is you water, it thoroughly saturates the pot, there's water hanging out in the, the spaces between those rocks, and because the water can't go anywhere and there's no roots down there to take it, it just sits and sits and sits and sits and sits. So uh, I, the good news is that because uh, Paisalis or Spathophyllum are so durable, I think yours does have a chance. But what you need to do is get it out of that soil in that pot as soon as possible. If the roots are really soggy and wet, I would actually leave it out of the soil for like a day or so to kind of dry off. Agreed. And then like Rick said... Uh, plant it with fresh potting soil into a container that has abundant drainage, not just one little tiny hole, not just one of those holes in the side, good drainage from the bottom. Get yourself a, a good coaster or saucer to put under it, and your, you and your piece of lily will be much, much happier. But I do think there's hope. You're just going to need to be a little bit patient and definitely make sure it does not suffer overwatering yeah, again. I agree, Stacy. And let me add to that. Uh, I have helped many people through the years with something called a cash pot, C-A-C-H-E. So you would take a container that has a drainage hole and slip it inside the pretty decorative plot, pot that you like. Now you can pull that container out from time to time, see what's going on in the bottom. But cash pot, C-A-C-H-E, your house plants, and you're going to find maintenance to be far far easier. And then, of course, Nancy's asking us also if there's a way to tell how old a jade plant is and what to do when it gets leggy. You know, I thought this was a good question because jade plants look a lot like trees, mm -hmm. but they are not trees. They're herbaceous plants. And so, no, you can't, you know, take a snip off your jade plant and count the rings and determine how <laughs> old it is. That would be cool if that happened. That would be cool. Uh, but that is not how it works, no matter how much it looks like a tree. So uh, the answer, unfortunately, is that there is really no way to tell how old your particular jade plant is um, and, and they can grow pretty fast you know depending on the conditions they can get fairly large fairly fast now I've seen them at, at botanical gardens that look like they have you know whole trunks yes. really really large so there is no way to tell how lar how old it is but you asked about what to do if it's too leggy it's a very very easy plant to propagate so all you need to do is take a few cuttings off the tip you know maybe five or so leaves worth or five or so sets of leaves strip off the bottom three and and just stick that thing in the soil. You can. I've often even just stuck it in the same soil that the plant is growing in. And it will root probably within a matter of a month. And uh, that will give you a whole new plant. And then you can start all over again. And with the plant being succulent in nature, lots of light. Lots light. of light. And not, not, not a lot of water. So that's today's gardening mailbag. Go to gardeningsimplifiedonair.com if you missed any of that. And when we come back, we're going to talk branching news. So please stay tuned. 
Happy New Year, everyone, and thanks for making the Gardening Simplified show a habit. Share the podcast with your friends and neighbors. Thanks for tuning it in. YouTube, look for us on YouTube. Subscribe. Look for Gardening Simplified show. And, of course, thanks to all of you listening to us on the airwaves on Wood Radio. So it's time for branching news here on our New Year's Eve show. And I wanted to mention that in Spain, I didn't know if you knew this, uh, Stacy, but instead of counting down to the New Year and clinking champagne glasses, instead, in Spain, they traditionally stuff 12 grapes into their mouths at the stroke of midnight. The 12 grapes represent the 12 months of the year. And in tradition, it's meant to bring good luck in the new year. Oh, that's fun. And I didn't know that, but I think it's true. Uh, it is true. I, I I'd actually, like to think I, it's I did true. know that. I did know that. I learned that in my previous <laughs> job at Martha Stewart Living Magazine. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I think that New Year's Eve is such a great holiday for food traditions. Yes. And um, I have a food tradition of my own that's really great for New Year's Eve. Might be too late for you, uh, depending on your supplies. Um, but I make bagels. And if you make bagels, you start them the day before you want them. So what I love about this as a food tradition is uh, I make them New Year's Eve and then they sit uh, in the refrigerator or I actually use my front porch because it's cold enough uh, in January um, and they sit on cookie sheets overnight and rise and ferment and then you bake them the next morning. That and is so cool. So it kind of has that really cool continuity of the night before. And uh, I like to pretend this is totally made up, but I do like to pretend that the hole in the bagel, your bad luck from last year falls through. So. I love that story. <laughs> I'm glad I brought this up. That is so cool. I wouldn't know how to make a bagel, but that is cool. Do you like cream cheese on your bagel? Oh, heck yeah. Yeah, same here. Got to have it. Now, it's very easy to make bagels. Really, all you need is yeast and flour, uh, bread flour, a high-protein flour. So if you have that around, I encourage you to, uh, to find a bagel recipe and give it a try. I think it's a little late for me, so I'm going to go with the 12 grapes this year, stuff them in my mouth. I have grape expectations for 2023. Did you catch that? I did. Thank you. <laughs> Just be grateful I have a good sense of humor. Oh, uh, Rick. Okay. Always with a bunch of puns. Now, in Slo <laughs> uh, Slovenia, they, uh, Slovenia is home to the oldest grapevine in the world, more than 450 years old. They celebrate it every year. They have a festival. They even have an anthem for this grapevine, and we'll put the link there. Uh, at Gardening Simplified on air, the show notes. It's that is so cool. cool. That's yeah. awesome. I'd love to see that grapevine. Let's do some holiday words of the day. Lucky bird. Lucky bird is a holiday word of the day. We're most likely to call them a first footer these days. But according to folklore, the first person across the threshold of your home on New Year's morning is the lucky bird. And they have an important bearing on the success of the year to come. Oh, lucky bird. So hope that the uh, the postal worker doesn't arrive with a letter from the IRS or something <laughs> like that, right? Uh, crump, crump, C-R-U-M-P. That's the crunching sound you make walking on partially frozen snow. That's called crumping. Oh, that's a good sound. I like that sound. I like that word. And then crapulence, crapulence. Once all the festive dust and New Year confetti has settled Here's a word for the morning after the night before, crapulence, in other words, sickness or, yeah, just not feeling so hot because of excessive drinking or eating. That sounds like a made-up word. Are you sure that's a real word? Crapulence. I think it was in The Simpsons, so I, I'm assuming that someone <laughs> made it up. But uh, Look it up and may you not experience crapulence. It's a, it's a good one to tuck away. After New Year's Eve. All right. Uh, this story, not funny, however, fortunately... No one was hurt. Everyone fine. They had a blaze at a swanky Mayfair restaurant. Now, Mayfair would be the, the community that's just north of uh, Buckingham Palace in England. Uh, celebrities love to go here. But they have a tradition of serving drinks, and, and they learned that the 4th of July and the holidays do not mix, Christmas and New Year's, because they put sparklers in the drinks. Um. And uh, this past week, one of those sparklers... Uh, instantaneously caught the Christmas tree on fire and the place lit up. Everyone ran for the exits. They got out safely. Many people still holding their drinks, uh, exiting the, uh, the pub, 
Uh, and again, everyone okay, firefighters, the staff, the crews, uh, but uh, they're saying not a good idea to put sparklers in your drink if you still have the Christmas tree up or you're in close proximity to the Christmas tree. I think that's common sense. I, I think that's good advice. You know, if you want a, a sparklier drink, I think you can go to the dollar store and get some of those, you know, battery operated glasses and uh, it's probably a lot safer. Wow, this is fascinating. So I'm going to make bagels. I'm going to the dollar store. I can't wait to see what else I'm going to do next. You got, don't forget the grapes while you're out. And the grapes, 12 grapes, grape expectations. Okay, in Milwaukee, uh, this past week, a home was raided. In it, the officers said they found 25 dogs, 23 birds, 14 rats, 8 hamsters, 7 hedgehogs, 6 lizards, 6 rabbits, 5 guinea pigs, 4 cats, 4 chinchillas, 3 tortoises, 2 alligators, 2 snakes, a goat, a ferret, and a raccoon, and a partridge in a pear tree. No, I just added that at the end. They found all that. In one home in Milwaukee. Oh, my gosh. I, I shudder to think about the condition of these poor animals. Usually if there's quantity like that involved, it's, oh, exactly. it's not good. So are they rescued? Are they, they are okay? rescued. All the animals are rescued. They had difficulty getting the long-horned goat out of the attic. The animal tried to headbutt animal control officers. It's not like you can just go up there and put them on a, on a leash. Uh, but... Uh, yeah, they got the goat out and all the animals. The animals are fine, but what an amazing story in Milwaukee this past. Uh, imagine week. the stories that an animal control agent would have to exactly. tell you. That seems like a podcast idea. Just... Exactly. And of course, I know you just got uh, back from France, Stacy, and the goats in France are more musical than the ones in America. I don't know what you mean. They have French horns. <laughs> don't goat me started. Okay. That's bad. I know. <laughs> well done. Several onlookers uh, have reported and witnessed uh, bright, unexplained lights darting across the skies in rural Wisconsin over the past few weeks. It's causing some people to question whether the illuminations were ide uh, unidentified flying objects. Now, of course, here on the Gardening Simplified show, and Stacy, throughout the course of your career as a horticulturist, uh, you've been involved in a lot of unidentified flowering objects, That's helping people sure. with that, right? And I definitely have. Them. But that uh, that white glow and that travel across the night sky, they're saying West Bend and Fredonia in the Badger State. It's an odd spectacle, and they're trying to uh, trying to determine. So for New Year's Eve, it's just kind of fun to think about unidentified flying objects. Well, you know, this is interesting because uh, we are in the process of printing our new Gardening Simplified Landscape Guide, and uh, it is actually printed in West Bend, Wisconsin. So I don't know if the really? uh, if it's if it's visitors from another galaxy, if they just wanted a little bit of landscape advice and a sneak preview of that. Uh, but when that is available, we will of course share that with our listeners, where you can get a copy and uh, and and uh, improve your landscape for 2023. You know, I would guess that they are gardeners because uh, I heard rumor was the the spacecraft landed and the first words out of their mouth were "Take me to your weed." So there you have it. Happy New Year to one and all. We want to thank Adriana Robinson. She's our engineer and producer. We could not do this show without her. Thank John Ilk back in the studios. I want to thank you so much, Stacy. It's just a pleasure to do this show with you. I learned so much from you, and I know our listeners across the fruited and rooted plain do too. And, and Happy New Year, because I'm really looking forward to 2023. Me too. It's such an exciting time to look ahead and uh, look forward to another gardening season and the, the cozy dreaming we have to do in the next couple months. I love it. Happy New Year, everyone. Thanks so much. Make sure to visit GardeningSimplifiedOnAir.com. Take care. <laughs>